wormhole to heaven. A DX7 trip report by Colby M. Posted to Earwid.org September 22nd, 2023. I'd experimented with robo-tripping a couple of times before, and really wanted a more intense trip. I was at a rough point in my life, and experimenting was an escape for me. I bought two 20 count bottles of extended release Robotussin, and later that night in my basement, I asked God or the universe, please let this make me a better person. I don't remember why I said that, but I knew I needed to for some reason. After pouring both bottles out on my mattress, I started eating them one at a time. Eventually, I started swallowing three or four at a time to speed up the process, and after finally finishing all 40 pills, I sat and waited. I listened to music for a bit, then played some computer games. My body movements felt heavy and slow. I enjoyed that feeling for an hour or so, and then it really started to kick in. I lay down on my bed, and felt my heart slow down. I closed my eyes, and the world dropped away. I floated upwards and stared down at my body for a moment, then was rocketed through space-time. I saw the surfaces of many unknown planets, or perhaps other dimensions rushing past. The rushing stopped when I was in a grassy field with a pink-tinged sky. I was next to a still pond of clear water. I felt so incredibly loved at that moment. Two figures descended from the sky and each took one of my arms. They took me upward through the sky to a golden city on the clouds. There were many spheres with their own large grassy spaces, and the figures took me into one of them. In that sphere was my brother's best friend who had died three years earlier. There was also a woman there with him, and they were both naked and glowing. It was a beautiful sight. He looked at me and said, You can't stay long, can you? I knew I couldn't, so I said no. After this, the spheres and cloudy city faded away, and I found myself in a pink-tinged field. In the field, there was a handsome man in a suit and tie. He told me to alternate doing mushrooms and LSD once every three months. This scene lasted for what seemed like a longish time. Next, everything faded to black, and there was no longer an eye to observe anything. After this, I saw two pyramids, one upside down in the shape of a diamond. Leading up to the top were the names of all the different world religions, including atheism. At the top was just the word Christ, and leading downward were other paths, one of which was hedonism. Then the words faded. The top pyramid turned bright blue, and the upside down pyramid turned black. The pyramids then separated, and there was a chain holding them together. Suddenly, something slashed the chain and the black pyramid fell away as the bright blue one rose upward. I then woke up face down on the floor, not at all where I'd fallen asleep. I felt so odd. Once the sun came up, I went up to my room. I sat outside my window on the roof and watched the sun rise. I closed my eyes and had a vivid vision of blood dripping down from a cross and pooling into a river. I felt myself lying in that river, and the feeling of pure love washed over me, broke my heart, to which I cried for the first time in years. It's at this point my life gets a bit hazy. My mum realised how much I'd taken when she saw the bottles in the trash. She proceeded to take me to the ER. I had another out-of-body experience in the hospital, and I vividly remember the sensation of my eyes rolling back as I travelled out of this reality again. I found my way back to my body, and woke up to the doctor being very angry at me. He told me there was no reason that I should still be alive. Maybe I had died for a few moments back there. My mum took me home once I stabilised, but the psychosis remained. I was convinced I was possessed by an angel of sorts. Long story short, I wound up at the ER again. They gave me a massive dose of Ativan, and took me to a psychiatric hospital via ambulance. It took a week and a half of being medicated with antipsychotics for the psychosis to fully end. And I have had long-lasting negative effects from all this, and will definitely not be attempting this again. The Inner Mind A DXM trip report by Nervewing Posted at Earwood.org August 16th, 2018 T plus zero hours. Begin drinking cough syrup. Try mixing it, chasing it with ginger ale. It's easiest to drink it if I just chase it. I managed to slug down one bottle in about five minutes. 
25 minutes, managed to drink the second bottle by now, already feeling slightly dissociated. Nausea is coming on strong. This stuff is absolutely disgusting. 40 minutes. I'm being drowned in a big swirling ocean of syrup. The swells toss me about and mould my form like I'm made of soft clay. I do not feel a progression through plateaus, rather I'm just sinking deeper and deeper into the deck sea. It reaches a point where I can no longer see straight with both eyes open. I get their classic dissociative double vision. I am on the MXE while I write this, oops. It follows with this sense of just being completely and totally lost in my own room. I do not know where I am, when I am, why I am, how I am, and I am wiped clean and left confused. It feels like my stomach is boiling. I know I have to hold it down as long as possible to absorb as much as I can. I know vomiting is near inevitable though. At 45 minutes, the yak comes. I throw up red syrup in a hideous cascade. Wow, this feels terrible. I never liked vomiting. It's painful, it's uncomfortable, it makes my eyes water and it makes me feel like my body is dismantling. But I get it out. And I feel a bit disappointed that I wasn't able to keep it down for longer. I will not get the full experience I desired, I'm pretty sure. T plus unknown hours. Per usual, the next however many hours is a dissociative blackout fog. Timeless and punctuated by brief moments of relative clarity. What I can remember is open-eyed visuals taking the form of warping and bulging of the space around me. It looked like the world had turned to syrup and was tilting in every direction slowly. I lost all sense of space. If I closed my eyes and opened them again, I would feel completely lost with no idea of what was up, down, left, right, forward, backwards, and I felt like I was the objects around me, not an independent being. Walking was pretty much impossible as well. If I close my eyes, it would be an instant out-of-body experience. No calm and gradual fading of myself. I was immediately cast into the dizzying void. Each time my eyes closed, a similar journey would take place with the same sequence. First I would see the room around me. It looked normal with the colours being heavily saturated. But soon after though, the dream space would collapse into the swirling abyss, coming apart piece by piece, dissolving into nothing. I would then be in a vast place that I would call the Dream Nexus. It seemed like an impossible huge spherical void which I was free to float in. The walls of this shell were covered with a grid of hundreds of thousands of apertures, and this is where things get a bit confusing. If I were to float in an aperture, I would awake in my bed again. I would get up and explore my house and encounter people I knew, either people I lived with, friends, or sometimes strangers. We would interact, and everything seemed very off. We spoke in terse, non sequiturs. I don't remember any of what was said, but it was all surreal and emotionally empty. Everyone was emotionally empty, and the colour was drained of the world. This whole time, I was actually still just lying in bed with my eyes closed. I could reset the cycle by opening and closing my eyes. With eyes open, a similar effect took hold as if my brain was trying its hardest to imbue this feeling in me no matter my state. Objects around me would morph into people, familiar people. They would just stand there, merely existing, looking like furniture. They kept appearing around me, hanging around me, and I didn't feel alone in my room at all. And in retrospect, I ended up having to ask my roommates if I really interacted with any of them during that time span, to which I did not. T plus five hours. I wake up. I don't know if I fell asleep or if the past three hours have been a total blackout. I'm down enough to have functional motor skills and it seems like my memory has touched down and is recording again. I still feel very dissociated and spacey. I still have the dex walk and still feel like everything is in motion. I have a sense of direction again and the visual effects have died down other than vision being super blurry. I hang out with my roommates and go scavenging for junk with them the rest of the night. T plus 9 hours. I go to bed, still feeling spacey. I wake up the next morning, still feeling like I'm on a low dose of dex. Still feel the dex walk, but it's not apparent and I look normal enough. The world feels dreamlike and unreal. It seems like everything is just fading into the background of existence. I have an appointment with my therapist and he's a bit irked that I'm altered while there. I still have vivid, closed eye visuals. And if I close my eyes long enough, I can really sink into them and almost sort of lucid dream. They are no longer replicated from the world around me, 
but rather are randomly generated. They take the form of tunnels and moving geometric objects. Looking out from my corpse, a DXM trip report by SMP, posted to Earwid.org January 13th, 2002. <sighs> DXM is an experience I will never forget. I've done acid and other drugs before, but I've never been through something so intense in my entire life. Me and two of her friends, Jen and Candice, decided we wanted to go to the movies and trip. Well, LSD wasn't available at the time that day for us to obtain, so we decided we were going to do a robo trip instead. We walked down to a local drugstore and bought three bottles of Robitussin Max, strength cough syrup, one bottle per person, making sure the active ingredient was DXM. I'd done a robo trip once before, but I was only able to consume half a bottle, if even that and then quit drinking it due to the horrible taste, and I can honestly say that nothing actually happened during that trip. Candice had done robo trips before, so she was the most experienced between the three of us, and Jen had never tripped on anything. We get to the movies early so that we are the first ones in the theatre, and we can drink our cough syrup alone. Getting this stuff down was not easy at all. It was horrible, but we all managed to get a whole bottle down our throats. From what I've read from other experiences, it takes about an hour to hit you. Well, not hours. We drank the bottle about 2.30pm and it hit us about 10 minutes later. It came on as feeling really drunk and our bodies started getting numb. Me and Candice thought it was the coolest thing in the world but Jen was just feeling really sick. When we got up and walked around it felt like we were heavily intoxicated and when we went back to our seats in the theatre I started seeing little visuals like trails and colour distortion. But that's about it. And when I had to step down a step, it looked like it was a five foot leap. Of course, I laugh at everything, so when I step off this step, I fall flat on my face laughing. And during this point, I'm thinking, wow, this is the coolest thing in the world. Although, I was very, very wrong. Jen started feeling really sick, and asked us to walk her to the bathroom. We get to the bathroom, and she tries to throw up the cough syrup to get out of her system. Nothing comes up, so we leave, and as we walk back in the door of the movie, she collapses again against the wall and starts vomiting. After she's done getting rid of the cough syrup from her stomach onto the wall, we leave the movie and sit in the hallway of the theatre on a bench. Jen said she felt a lot better after that, and Candice was having a blast with her numb body. And, well, as for me, I start to feel really tired and sick. What I list next is all I remember and what my friends told me. I remember sitting on the bench inside the theatre and passing out, waking up in the corner of the theatre in my friend's lap and them laughing at me and asking if I'm feeling anything. I remember blacking out several times and what seemed like 50 years was only about one minute. My body went completely numb and I could hear myself asking questions like, what time is it? Am I dead yet? I couldn't actually feel my mouth moving and right after I would ask these, I would blank out so I never remember asking it, and I would ask those questions repeatedly every two minutes. Eventually, I woke up and puked in the movie theatre and passed out again, and my friends said they started getting really scared when I kept asking, Am I dead yet? Am I gonna die? Please don't let me die. You can't die on this stuff, right? Because I'm pretty scared right now, not gonna lie. And people who worked at the theatre started getting suspicious, so we had to leave but I don't remember them or my friends saying we had to leave. But I do remember passing out again, and Candice and Jen trying to pick me up and carry my lifeless body outside the theatre. Candice later told me after the trip, when she tried to pick me up, she couldn't feel my muscles at all, and it felt exactly like pulling on a dead body. So, when we got outside, I guess they put me on a bench outside, and I passed out, and when I awoke, Jen or Candice were near me, and I was screaming their name. Eventually they ran over to me, and I told them to stay with me the rest of the time until we left. Candice got really scared, because I was saying some, well, some scary shit, talking about death. She called her parents and told them what we'd done, and to come pick us up. Now, here's where shit gets really bad, and I will never forget this. I remember lying on the bench and couldn't feel anything. I was just lying there with my eyes open, I couldn't feel myself breathing, blinking, talking, etc. And I kept saying, am I dead yet, over and over. But I couldn't feel my mouth moving. I felt like my soul was trapped inside my dead body. And I was looking out and I saw these paramedics coming towards me. There was my parents and a crowd of people around me. And I heard the paramedics say, she isn't going to make it. 
and then rushed me to the hospital and I saw myself in the stretcher, hooked up to all these tubes and the doctor saying, we're sorry, but your daughter is dead. And then I saw my funeral. It was so real and so scary, but of course all of this was a very intense dream and I didn't want to die of stupidity from a drug overdose and especially from drinking something as stupid as cough syrup. So I saw my family and friends all around my grave and me in a coffin. Then I come back to being a soul in a dead body at the movies, looking out at the world as I lie here dead. Then the most unbelievable thing that has ever happened to me happened. And whoever reads this is going to think I'm on crack, but I swear a light shone down on me, and I swear it was God. And I must say I never believed in God until that happened. And my lifeless body came back to life, coming back into reality. By that time, Candace's dad finally got there after I'd already died. I'd been to the hospital and had a funeral. But he managed to get there and I fell asleep in the car, waking up in their driveway puking and her parents screaming at us. And by now, I'm just really drunk. And I've come way down off my trip. At 7.30 is when I was able to talk. I was somewhat normal by then, but all in all, it ended up being normal at about 9pm. In conclusion, it was scary as hell and I didn't really go into too much detail about how bad the blackouts were. There really are no words that can describe just how bad it was, and hopefully no one will ever experience a trip like I'd gone through. I honestly thought I was either going to die, or be permanently screwed up for the rest of my life, and my friends thought the same thing. The next morning though, I must say, I felt excellent. Jen felt hungover, and Candice felt like complete ass. Personally, I will never do this ever again. I can't say I regret it, and I think it was an experience well learned, and it was way too intense for comfort. Certainly, doing it in a public place like a movie theatre was the biggest mistake. Different Worlds A DXM trip report by Rich, posted to Irwood.org, July 15th, 2005. It was about 9pm on a summer night. I had no place to sleep, so I decided to call up a friend so I could crash at his house. When I got over to my friend Chris's house, we were bored as hell, so we decided to go to the closest grocery store and steal us some Robitussin. So we took scooters over there, stole a bottle of the Robitussin maximum strength coffee each, and bought a soda for a chaser. On the way home, we both downed our Tussin. By the time we had gotten home, we were fully tripping. Chris wasn't as used to it as I was, so he was pretty out of it, but I, however, was not. I just felt mildly drunk and a little speedy. So after about an hour or so of boredom, I suggested we make another trip to the store. This time we walked there, so we could enjoy tripping on the way there. Anyway, we both stole another bottle of RMSC and drank it on the way home. Well, by the time we got into the basement of his house, I could hardly walk at all. We both had trouble standing up, let alone walking down the stairs to his room in the basement. Now, this basement was no ordinary basement, it was more like a dungeon, or so I thought it was. There were pipes leading to his furnace that had flames shooting out of it all times. The floor was dirt and the atmosphere was muggy. Not a nice place to be tripping in. Anyways, we had turned off the lights and went to bed, but I couldn't sleep. I was haunted by the general atmosphere of the room. I felt like I wasn't in a familiar place, but I was too scared to say anything. So I looked to my left and suddenly I'm not where I thought I was. And I could no longer remember where I used to think I was at all. So therefore... I was in a strange place trying to think of where I used to think I was. This led to an acceptance of my surroundings due to the lack of any previous knowledge of where I am. Suddenly I realised that I've been hearing voices for hours. People looking for me, calling my name. Rich, where are you? I felt the presence of three people far below me, which were of course the people calling my name. I thought to myself that I must be hiding from them. So I decided to remain in my current position and survey the situation before calling out to them. I looked down and saw three people wearing hard hats and operating heavy machinery and such. So I came up with the conclusion that I was part of some sort of construction crew and I was just being lazy and not working. I thought to myself that I'd better say something before they leave without me. So I stood up from my bed and yelled out, Well, here I am. I'm ready to work now. Just then, Crips gets out of bed and turns on the light and says, What the hell are you doing? Then I realised I was going to have a really odd night with this drug in the dark, moist basement. I laid back down to try and sleep again, and just as I was falling asleep, it started over again. 
Only, this time, I was in a different place with absolutely no previous knowledge of how I had even gotten there. This new place was very distinct. I was in a spaceship with millions of other human carrying pods. There was no gravity, therefore I was strapped to the bed. As I screamed and tried to break free, Chris turned on the light. This same thing went on all night long until the morning, and I really didn't get any sleep at all. I went to various different locations, none of them being pleasant. I was in jail, the bottom of the ocean, even a concentration camp. It's trips like these that really make me think about what kind of a person I really am to dream up such crazy, crazy things. The Singing Air Conditioner A Nutmeg and DXM Trip Report by Spirit Earth Posted to Shroomery.org six years and five months ago Let me start out by saying that nutmeg is nuts. It can turn you into a nut. This is not something that should be messed with without caution. You could easily end up in a bad trip and feel like you have to flu for up to 24 hours. It's not hard to end up taking too much. So if you are going to do it, Start out with a small dose the first time, and build from there. I started by taking three tablespoons of some ancient pre-ground nutmeg powder found in the kitchen cabinet. At 8pm, after finishing the dose, I drank a dose of alcohol in the form of four loco, four shots or beers worth, I guesstimate, followed by another small beer. I drank them slowly and was feeling pretty good, a nice buzz and that amazing feeling that alcohol gives. So I'm playing guitar, enjoying the alcohol buzz, waiting for any effects from the nut powder, when I decided to go and get more booze. I'm riding my bike to the store, having an amazing time en route, but when I get to the store, it is past 3am, so I cannot get any more booze, since this is the store policy. So I decide I'm going to buy a vanilla and orange extract to keep the alcohol buzz going. Kind of lame, but it does the trick, almost as strong as vodka or rum. Well. Right there, next to the extracts, is organic pre-ground nutmeg. It's been over five hours since the first nutmeg dose was taken, and I was feeling very minor effects, so I decided to get the nutmeg at the store. I also picked up some DXM at 300mg to combine with the nutmeg and alcohol. I could not wait to witness the beauty that was coming. It must be amazing when it kicks in. So I dosed the 300mg of DXM while at the store. Now I get back home and dose the nutmeg. The other batch was old and had been sitting in the cabinet for who knows how long and must have been low in potency. I'm feeling effects, but only very minor. So this is when I decide to dose another four tablespoons, but this time of the organic brand new nut powder that I just got. I just sat there feeling funny. I had to just sit there and chill, relax, because the DXM was coming up and I felt sick. You know that feeling from DXM that feels like you just ate a whole bottle of cough medicine gel caps. Not too bad, but it was kind of intense, so I just sat and chilled. Don't believe it when people say you can't trip on the pre-ground you buy at the store. If it isn't old and you just bought it, then you may trip. I sure did. Mine was organic, and organic nutmeg was the only ingredient. So now I take a shot of the vanilla extract. Feeling very nice and buzzing, and feeling excellent really. I just sat there playing guitar for like an hour, having a blast. I felt like some singer from the 70s or 80s. The sun began to rise. It is early morning. I am still on DXM and begin to feel the nutmeg's effects, but just starting to come up, not near peak or full effects at all. Pretty much just chilled back and meditated for a while. Played more guitar while finishing the last of the extracts. Really nice buzz again coming up. The nutmeg and DXM combo felt very strange. I then started to feel sick. Like in my body. Nothing seemed real. Stuff started to get intense now. My body began to feel slightly sweaty and shaky, but very mild, nothing severe. I had to use my experience with high doses of DXM in the past and how to calm down when it's getting intense. 
I could have freaked out, but all I had to do was calm down and relax. I had to confront and face the parts of myself that I needed to work on, or things that I wasn't conscious of before that were affecting my life negatively, that were seen more clearly during this state. There was a sense of delirium with this substance, like DPH in a way, kind of disturbing, like madness. At the beginning of the trip I actually felt low rather than high, like I was low because I was being weighed down, like my body was a giant nut weighing several tons. The body load. Well, if you've tripped on Hawaiian baby woodrow seeds, you know exactly how this feels. I had become a nut. I lay on my back, feeling like a giant nutmeg nut. So heavy, this nostalgic LSA body feel. I had gone nuts. The body load was heavy and intense, it was awful. Very unpleasant, and though similar to the LSA body load, this had a sick feeling to it. It felt as if I took a toxic substance that has made me feel sick, but nothing too bad. It just felt unpleasant, and my mouth was as dry as a desert, and eyes as if I smoked a fat blunt. To be honest, by now, I just wanted it to be over, but I had to ride it out. I could feel the taste and feeling of the nutmeg nut in my mouth and digesting in my stomach and body, like the spirit of the nutmeg nut itself. The body load by now was awful, but once that dissipated, it actually felt rather nice. Sensations of relaxation and euphoria similar to cannabis had covered my body like a blanket. Everything was moving slightly, and my arms looked weird like a painting, or actually my arms kind of looked like flowing water. My air conditioner was extremely loud, and it seemed I could hear the very detail of every sound the fan or air conditioner was producing. It sounded really strange, and kind of like water as well. It's like I was tapping into the detail of sound, or was picking up different sounds I couldn't hear before or wasn't aware of. Like the air conditioner was making so many very pronounced and just sounds like water or air. So, a talented and gifted singer passed away at the time of my trip, and I found this out while I was tripping. I was watching YouTube videos all night in memory of the famous singer, like his interviews and stuff. I mean, he's got a lot of positive and encouraging messages, and is like a wise teacher in his interviews, to be honest. Quite interesting. Well, now it had been over 12 hours since I started tripping at this point, and though the body load was gone, I was still tripping and high. Actually, I can't believe how similar this felt to Bud, like a firecracker weed edible. I was still on YouTube with headphones in when I heard what sounded like voices or people talking out in the yard, but the air conditioner was so loud too. Like not annoying, like really loud, but it was so pronounced, like the details of the many different sounds the fan was making. I heard the voices a couple more times, but I'm not sure if it was actually people talking in my yard or auditory hallucinations. Perhaps my brother might have friends over, or maybe it was the neighbours. This singer was so inspiring in his interviews on YouTube while I was still tripping, seeing my walls moving and all that. I couldn't quite believe it. It's like a cannabis high, but lasting up to 24 hours. And I guess I can't really complain with that. Very interesting indeed. My room looks like a painting or a work of art. It had been over 24 hours since I'd slept, and this added to the delirium DPH feel to the trip. I'd stayed up for 33 hours just about at this point. So yeah, everything is still moving and breathing now, and the uh, people's faces looked all trippy and weird. Like on DXM, people's faces looked trippy as shit. Well anyway, I'm still watching YouTube videos with headphones on, and I start to hear really weird noises and sounds in my air conditioner. I pause the YouTube video to examine it. I guess it's just auditory hallucinations. Like just mysterious, odd, strange-like sounds and noises. Hard to describe, but sounds like wind, and sounds like underwater voices. I kind of hear voices, but they sound underwater and alien. It all seems to be blended in with the sounds of my fan and air conditioner that keeps me cool in the summer. It's really cool, to be honest. The air conditioner was just making sounds. I could hear the detail of the sound, it was making many different sounds, and they weren't loud, but just pronounced, and uh, I don't know. In the sound of my air conditioner, along with the sounds like dripping and underwater sounds, there was these air and wind sounds. Just strange sounds in general, and even voices, but like I said, as if they were coming from underwater. It sounded to me like the air conditioner was breathing, but one long, continuous, never-ending breath instead of in and out. 
it was freaky and weird. And at first, I kept saying to myself, like, this is weird. I don't think I actually like this. But then, I just kept on watching YouTube videos, still hearing weird sounds in the background. And I also saw static, or these movements in the corner of my eye, like blobs of colour. An interesting experience all around, was awful at first, and wouldn't want to repeat that part of the trip again. After the body load went away, it wasn't too bad though. Very relaxing, very trippy and colourful. I still can't believe how similar this was to a cannabis edible high, like a firecracker, but lasting hours and hours upon end. I had the munchies as well, and the cotton mouth and bloodshot eyes, the classics, as well as dehydration. The fruit I ate was too good, it helped the dry mouth massively. So I would say it was an interesting experience, and other than the first part of the trip with the heavy body load and sick feeling in the body, I guess it was worth it. I enjoyed the trip following the body load. If you're going to do it, I'd recommend starting with a really low dose and not redosing if it doesn't work. But wait and try a higher dose like a week later until you hit the right spot. Now, I would never recommend mixing drugs without experience or caution, and don't actually advise doing this at all. But if you are going to do it, just be careful. I saw my soul, God, and heaven. A DXM trip report by Trippy Trip Corey, uploaded to Eruid December 24th, 2001. On Tuesday night, I took an 8 ounce of Robitussin maximum strength cough syrup. I got even more motor weirdness than the last time. After about 4 hours, my brain felt like it was fried, and the general feeling was a combination of LSD, enhanced mind stimulation, unreality, ketamine, with slurred speech, floatiness and motor impairment, and ecstasy, euphoria, as well as alcohol, a decreased ability to communicate and lack of inhibition. The shifting, dizzy visual field was present in the beginning, but faded after a while. I had great difficulty walking and going to sleep. Two bong hits during the trip didn't seem to have the usual weed effects. Hangover the next morning. Enjoyable, but not special. Thursday night was quite a different story. I took a 5 ounce of Robo, and then 2 hours later I took 3 ounce of Robo. In theory, this should have been a weaker trip, but I turned out to be wrong. Possibly there was some cumulative effect from the Tuesday trip, but I don't know really. After one and a half hours, I felt goofy and light. Then I went with two friends to a library. It was difficult for my eyes to focus on anything. I found every comment that anyone said funny. I felt goofy, but also a little bit paranoid. I smiled at these two people uncontrollably. I saw another friend and had a brief conversation about acid, spiders and DXM. My speech was slurred, and continued to slur the whole night. We returned to Person X's house, where I took the remaining 3 ounce of Robo. People and comments were becoming very unreal. The paranoia was heightened to the point where I wondered whether I passed by with friends or enemies. This was not like acid paranoia though, because I felt generally pleasant the whole time. I was not able to blink very much during this period, and my friends today appeared glassy eyed and distant. I was scaring them and yet I was having a great time. Pretty soon, I got the sensation that my brain was fried. This is just how I felt, not a statement about reality. I was feeling crazy or insane. I read too much into what people were saying. I felt like Robert De Niro in Taxi Driver when he was staring at the pimps in the restaurant. We went to visit a friend at a hotel. Very mild hallucinations started. They were very different from LSD hallucinations in at least two ways. One being LSD hallucinations exist side by side with waking reality, as far as my experiences go. DXM hallucinations are more like vivid recollections. Two, LSD visuals seem very two-dimensional. In retrospect, DXM visuals are very much 3D. So 3D that they can seem 4D. It's almost like wearing a virtual reality mask. For some reason, I imagined that my friends and I had gone to 7-Eleven, but they said that was not the case. My friends and I returned to the house. The DXM had shifted gears on me. I drifted into another world. My thoughts had become a hallucinatory field. The visuals could be interrupted by another person's speech, but only briefly. I kept jumping from the real world to the Dex world and back and forth. One of my friends said something about Japan. 
I said that I had always considered Japan as a part of the West, but then I wondered, why did I ever think that? I was struck by the fact that it was all bullshit and conditioning. All the bullshit that I had ever been fed came to me in a rush of clarity. I could actually see the bullshit. My friend talked about the process of conditioning, but I only caught fragments of her speech and occasional glimpses of her face. The hallucinatory field was almost total now. In the Dex world, I saw myself as a bird. I was flying rapidly from South America to North America, seeing all of the countries as they actually were, although there were more trees present than exist in reality. I saw how my conditioned views were far different from reality. This thought has occurred to me many times before, but on DXM I could actually see the effects of the conditioning. It was quite emotional. This all came to me in a rush. Being this bird, I was uninhibited by artificial, political boundaries, sin fronteras. I could see how powerful and yet how arbitrary borders were. I was amazed. I went into my friend's room in total awe. I was completely uninhibited, and I told her that I felt comfortable sharing my soul with her. I was struck by the fact that I am so afraid to tell people what I am really thinking and feeling in everyday life. My friend and I talked for a while, but I don't remember what we said exactly. I just remember feeling very excited and euphoric slightly similar to ecstasy. My friend had an angelic aura about her that I could clearly see. Soon, I left my friend's room. All the nerve endings in my body felt fried or maxed out. Thoughts came out semi-automatically and did not require the usual processing. Indeed, processing became impossible. Everything just flowed. I was truly amazed by my experiences so far, because I had only planned on getting fucked up. I didn't expect these psychedelic revelations but the best was yet to come. When I turned the lights out, the most amazing thing happened. All pain seemed to leave my body. The hallucinatory field became total. I saw the frontal lobe of a brain suspended in darkness. The folds of the brain separated into 3D cubes that slowly rolled forward in unison. I was gliding on the cubes, and yet standing apart from them at the same time. Each cube contained an image, a memory of mine. When I saw a particular image that caught my eye, I could focus in on it and re-experience the memory. It was as if I had total recall of everything I had ever done, but somehow I could control which memories I recalled and which ones I didn't. I truly thought during these moments that I had seen my entire soul, heaven and God all at the same time. This was strange to me, because I don't believe in God or heaven, and I believe that the soul is a set of biochemical processes, not separate from the mind. I went outside to smoke a cigarette. As I looked up at the sky, I could recall perfectly my third acid trip. Not just the visuals, but the feeling behind it. I felt godlike in my revelations, and yet I also felt more human than I ever felt before. When I re-entered the house, I felt a sense of total joy, peace and love. I was so excited by what I had seen, that I told my friend all about it. She said later that she had never seen me so excited. I told her that as long as we both shall live, that we should never, ever forget that I had just seen God. I went back to my bed and closed my eyes. The visuals returned. The most memorable was a blue flame that was coming towards me. It was not a burning flame, however, but a cleansing flame. Soon afterwards, I got the distinct sensation, and visuals to go along with it, that my soul was leaving my body. I walked to the kitchen to get some water. As I was in the kitchen, I thought I had left my body behind, I want to re-emphasise that I still could not understand how I was even capable of rational thought. The insane feeling, however, had passed, and as I returned from the kitchen, I saw that my body was not lying on the bed. I guess I hadn't even left my body after all, but it felt so real. I was so full of joy, it's really hard to describe. After this point, I decided to get some sleep. The come down was gradual, no hangover in the morning. I felt completely refreshed the next day. It had been one of my most fulfilling experiences ever. As pleasant as it was, I had no immediate desire to repeat the experience. I remember how my past acid binge had been a failed attempt to recreate my first four amazing trips. I think I will dex again, but always in moderation and with all these lesions in mind. God lives in a bottle of cough syrup. Wow.
Life and death. Nothing really matters. A DXM and cannabis trip report by Reefer Spirit. Uploaded to Eerwid November 10th, 2020. This is kind of long, but it's very detailed. The names have been changed. A little afternoon, my friend Damien picked me up. He knew what he was doing, but I'd never done voodoo before just because I couldn't get it without drinking bottles of cough syrup. In preparation, neither of us had eaten anything that day. Around one, we each took one pill. This was not cough medicine, it was pure DXM. I'm not exactly sure how many milligrams were in the pills or anything, but it was some strong shit. It takes a while for the capsules to open the stomach, so we had plenty of time to smoke a joint before we felt any effects from the voodoo. We drove down into the woods to this cool little cave where Damien and his roommates liked to trip. Since it was during the day and in August, Damien informed me that we'd have to go somewhere cold and dark because the heat and bright light would make us really, really sick and completely miserable. We brought sleeping bags to keep warm, several bottles of Sprite and water and a kerosene lamp. On the way down, I could feel the capsule open in my stomach. We got all our shit set up in the cave, which was a little room, big enough for maybe three people to lie down in, with tunnels leading off in four different ways. About ten minutes after I felt the capsule open, my body started to feel extremely heavy. Damien had this feeling too, and we laid down. He'd warned me that we would get sick, and since weed helps me to keep me from puking, we'd brought about five or six joints and a huge resin weed ball. I started to feel a little sick, but it was so hard to move because it felt so heavy. We smoked another joint. It was getting harder and harder to move, so before it got any more difficult, we sort of crawled and slid to a lower part of the cave. After this point, I can't remember all the details or exactly what order everything happened, but I will describe it as well as possible. I remember stretching out on a small ledge about two or three feet off the ground. I puked a couple of times, but it wasn't a problem because I knew it was going to happen. Then, I felt like I was rising off the ground. I stayed floating for a few minutes, maybe eight inches off the ground. I'd been just staring straight ahead, and when I looked around, I realised I was moving my hands around. Then, my entire body went numb, and I wasn't floating anymore. I think I asked Damien about it, but he was too fucked up to answer me. After a few minutes, it occurred to me that I was puking again, and I hadn't even realised it. I was staring straight ahead, and the rock wall became a beautiful Native American city, sort of like Mesa Verde. I remember seeing three white doors sewn together with dark red stitching and orange outlines. They disappeared, and I saw about five windows in a wall built of carved square stones. Then, I saw ladders leading to bigger doorways, and it all started to sparkle like it was sprinkled with gold. All of this appeared with a reddish tint, I suppose because the only light we had was fire. I forgot where I was, but I didn't care. I think the whole time I was watching this, I was mumbling stuff like, wow thank you, I love you, etc. Just saying it over and over without realising it. I remember asking Damien, do you see it? And he said he did. Then I got sick again, even though I thought that part was over. I think he was puking then too. After a few minutes, we were slightly more conscious and I thought it was starting to wear off. Then came the next wave. I looked down off my little ledge and saw through the floor into an underground city full of sparkling gold. I tried to touch it, but I couldn't reach. I'm not positive what happened next, I was so far gone. I didn't know I was in a cave with Damien, or who I even was. I didn't know I was on drugs. I must have realised I didn't know what was going on, because I recall saying, I forgot what reality is like. Then I floated off again, and I can't even remember what happened for a little while. I think I started to puke again. I was breathing so loudly, it was more like moaning. I could hear it but I didn't think about what it was. That went on for most of the rest of the trip. I started to get a little scared, and I think I was crying, but I'm not sure. Damien was mumbling apologies for something. I don't have any idea what my body was doing for quite a while after this point, just what I was thinking. I asked Damien if I was alive or dead, and he said, I know, or something like that. I thought that was disturbing, and asked him again. He said I was alive but I wasn't sure if he was telling the truth. I wondered if I should be in the hospital. There was a point I was even considering never doing drugs ever again, if I lived. We were underground, and I thought maybe that was because I was already buried. I knew what it was like to die. 
I thought about how nobody would ever find our bodies way out here. Then, I slowly stopped caring. I still didn't know if I was dead or not, but it didn't really matter. I just kind of accepted it. Although, I wish that I could say goodbye to my lover. Another blank spot in my memory, probably still contemplating life and death. I came back a little and realised I was breathing so hard and told Damien I couldn't stop doing it. He was also in between the peaks of really intense shit and he pointed out to me that I was shaking really bad. He told me I should get in a sleeping bag, but I couldn't move so he sort of pulled me up a little and put it over me. When he moved, it made me dizzy and I think I puked again. I'm not positive, but we may have started the resin ball here and smoked some before the next wave of the shit hit us. When it came, I don't remember as much about it as the first ones. I kept freaking out and asking him if it was still there, along with other weird questions, most of which I can't recall. I wanted to know what time it was, and he told me it was probably about 2 or 3. Big gap in my memory here, and more puking I think. The lantern went out, and I was freaking out about it. It seems like I was yelling about it, but I don't think I could have yelled at the time, since it's hard even to talk correctly. I later learnt that only people on DXM could understand other people on DXM. Damien was considerably more sober than I was by now, since he'd done it a bunch of times and is also about twice my size. He dragged me to another place in the cave where there was a little light coming in from the opening. He wrapped me in a sleeping bag, and then he went to the house and took another part of a pill. I came down a little when he was dragging me around, but then it hit me again. Not quite as bad as before though. I don't remember what happened while he was gone, or knowing he was back. But when I came down again, he was laying next to me and we smoked another joint. We just laid there for who knows how long. I can't really describe the feeling. It wasn't intense, but it was not the more conscious feeling we experienced in between peaks. I had my eyes closed the whole time, but I wasn't asleep. I saw visions on the back of my eyelids. Damien later told me he was doing the same thing. I couldn't move voluntarily yet, and I was still occasionally breathing hard and couldn't stop shaking. My watch kept beeping. I thought it was like every 10 minutes or so. Only later did it occur to me that it only beeps every hour. We woke up every so often and smoked a joint. Around 7 or 8 p.m., Damien's roommate came down into the cave and we kind of snapped out of it a little and finished the resin ball. I could sit up now. We crawled out of the cave, but we had to stay in the shade because our eyes were still extremely sensitive to light. Voodoo vision. We went back to the house and laid on the couch watching movies and listening to music till about 11pm because we were still slightly retarded and didn't want to move. I couldn't see as well the next couple of days, but that's to be expected from any hallucinogenic drug. It was an amazing trip. I feel like I know what death is like, and I am not as afraid of it as I used to be. I had just tried 2CT2 for the first time a couple of weeks before, and I'd had a mixed bag of experience, due to either taking too much of it, or dosing too closely together. So last Wednesday, I figured my tolerance had dropped enough for a leisurely good time at least, and I wasn't looking for a full-blown gourding anyway. Early on in the evening, I'd started popping robogels for a chest cold I've had for over a week now. I'm never one to take the prescribed dose of anything, so I just take a handful of them and lay down. I'd eaten earlier, and was relaxing on the couch watching the tube when I decided to take a little bit of the last two of my T2 stash, around 25mg. I just dabbed my pinky into the bottle and administered it rectally. I figured the come up would be quick and there wouldn't be any tummy issues like I'd experienced on earlier experiments. It took about 45 minutes to come on. At this point it was basically just a body high. It was okay, but basically a yawn. So I decided to take another dab and wash it down with some water. The come up from the additional dose was much quicker, and was seamlessly integrated into the experience as a whole. So I'm watching something on the TV, can't remember exactly what, 
and I was tripping decent at a plus two level or so. There's only some mild visuals, with no pronounced patterns or images. With eyes open, the room looked sharp, as if the contrast had been tweaked on a TV set or something like that. I took the rest of my robogels for a total of 20 pills, around 300 milligrams. The combined dissociative effect with the psychedelic effect was interesting. I wait about an hour and just say fuck it, and down the last of the powder in my medicine bottle, because I figure it wouldn't be rewarding to take such a small dose on its own anyway. The full effects hit at about three hours, and the combo with the DXM created a unique mind space, neither one or the other as far as dissociative versus psychedelic. I lay down and drift off for a while, not really thinking or focusing on anything, just being, floating maybe. But then it completely shifts in its nature. I am now no longer tripping. I remember no visual distortions at this point. My mind drew silent. There was no thought, yet I was able to form thoughts if I wanted to. I felt extremely lucid, relaxed, at ease. There was no disturbance inside or out. It reminded me of how I would get after prolonged sitting meditation. Clarity and insight into the mind that was effortless. It was a sense of gentle, silent benevolence sweeping through my being. I just breathed slowly, and sat up to look around the room. It was dark but clear. I could see the moon outside shining its soft silver light. All there was, was silence. Stillness. I was exploding with joy. On the verge of tears, even. Just the memory of it, and I'm starting to well up now. I was no one. Empty. There was only joy and love remaining. I smiled gently to myself, and just basked in the breath. The air felt like... Well, I don't know. There was no inside or outside. It was just this. I waved my hand around and laughed at the symmetry of the gentle trailers coming off of it. Again, there was no real patterning or imagery at all. I felt an overwhelming impulse to pray. Something I never really do nowadays. I said something to the effect of, I want to share this with every living being. I want them to know this peace and joy right now. All of the countless living creatures. May we all awaken and share this together. I asked no one in particular for forgiveness. May all of my misdeeds be purified. May my intentions be true. May all of the harm and wrongdoing I have done be undone. May it be rectified. May I harm no one ever again. My voice dropped to a low and even pitch that sounded at peace and without any ego. At least it seemed so. There was an echo after my words, like a digital delay or some sort of reverb. It was like a perfect mystical experience as someone would picture it. There was just perfection in every word, in every breath, in every gesture. I asked myself in an amused way, who is the master? Where is Joshu now? Where is the Buddha? Where is the true self now? And the answer flashed instantly and silently. We are. All of us. This one. We are alone. Forever alone. But together. We are all we have. Forever and ever. Well, at this I just lost it. And wept with despair and joy and love and release all at the same time. Just to be alive. Amazing. How could we ever become so lost? How could there ever be any confusion as to our place and role in existence? And most of all, how could there be any separation and hatred toward our brothers and sisters, ourselves? I wept and wept at my ignorance and wrongdoing. I just wanted the mercy of the infinite to embrace me and give me peace. I was ready to die. I would give my life for yours. I would give my life for yours. The meaning and reality of love struck me so deeply that it would be offensive to even try and describe the utter simplicity of it. The beauty in everything that is asleep, just waiting to awaken. How could I ever deserve this gift? I could never, not in a million lifetimes, be worthy in myself to receive this kind of love and acceptance. As I write this, my heart is pounding my chest is shaking. 
My cheeks are wet with unwiped tears. All I can say is that I feel grateful. Gratitude. That is all. There is no answer other than this. No higher truth to be known. It is a matter of continued disciplined practice to actualize this experience in all of my actions. And that may never be completely accomplished. But we have nothing but time. My weekend was a tad more interesting than most. Here goes it. I'd been in the throes of planning the psychedelic vision quest from fate for well over a month. Ideally, it would be a marriage of an eighth of mushrooms and five hits of blotter, each of both myself and my girlfriend, who, for the sake of anonymity, I'll refer to simply as C. Taking into account the significance of set and setting, C and I had been preparing ourselves mentally for the voyage for weeks, and we'd resolved to go camping somewhere near the beautiful Florence area of the Oregon coast. Fate, as it seems, finds pleasure in throwing unexpected curveballs. There'd been massive bust by police two weeks prior, and the Bart Simpson supply had temporarily run dry. Every hookup window was stumped. Thankfully, we at least had the quarter ounce of cubes. Thank God for agriculturally minded hippie folk. Undaunted by the fascism of law enforcement, C and I continued with our original plans. The only difference was a stop on the way out of town to take advantage of sale prices and Robitussin. Dextromethorphan would be our shuttle to the Tryptamine Airport. Destination, Consciousness City. Wasting no time, C and I chugged two bottles each of the bitter red syrup in the parking lot, washing it down with Oddwaller grapefruit juice. Time management here was essential. We'd left town much later than expected, and worried about the availability of campsites on a Saturday. The drive would provide ample time for the subjective effects of the DXM to manifest, preparing the proverbial launch pad for our trip into psilocybin hyperspace. None of the effects were felt until C and I arrived at our destination. The break in my concentration on the hazards of the road allowed my awareness to focus on the strong DXM-induced mind-body dualism. Parking the car next to the host campsite, I looked in the rearview mirror. My pupils had obscured all trace of colour in my eyes, save a tiny circle of green. I was fucked up. The flanging effect of the DXM was quite pronounced. My vision no longer retained continuity of motion, as I noticed my perception was broken into frames. The black frames in my visual sensorium were occurring with an almost mathematical cadence, about one black frame of visual perception for every four regular frames. My body was an awkward, analgesic mess. Robo-walk undoubtedly followed shortly, so I quickly exited the car to tend to the necessary business of paying for our overnight camp. Sometime later, after smoking several bowls of C, we decided it was time to shroom. We evenly divided the quarter into halves, and proceeded to chew on the earthy stems and caps, after smoking two more bowls and waiting about 30 minutes, we were determined to go for a walk. We made it to the mouth of the sand dune trail, when we realised our consciousness was extremely altered. I sat down next to C, who was obviously having great difficulty in integrating the intense experience. My entire body felt alive with a gentle humming sensation, and the visual distortions of the mushrooms were beginning to reveal themselves. What I would experience next would render me speechless. As C and I sat on the top of a sand dune, I noticed pieces of reality beginning to fragment and shift wildly. Pieces of my visual perception would seem to break off and move about randomly, only to return mysteriously into place. All objects were cloaked in a rainbow aura, and I detected an internal dialogue of two voices conversing in gibberish. The flanging effect of the DXM was also still present, and the black spots in my visual field were filled with detailed hallucinations. Of the visions I remember, one stood out in haunting significance. I perceived an infinitum of mutilated, disembodied heads floating in a black void. Usually my visions are of such an abstract nature that they bear no resemblance to reality, but this vision disturbed me with its lifelike detail. I looked down at the sand beneath me, 
and witness the likenesses of people forming and dissipating to the rhythm of the distant tide. My attention, however, was quickly drawn to another couple, walking hand in hand down the dune trail to the nearby beach. With no regard for the splendour of nature, they discarded an empty pack of cigarettes in a tuft of nearby reed grass. I looked at the pack, and then looked towards the sun. Sol was the unwavering constant in this newfound world of flux, and I felt the intensity of his warmth tenfold. This cannot continue, echoed a booming voice through my skull. I realised quickly what the voice meant. Such wanton destruction of the environment could not continue. Careless litterbugs are significant of a greater societal malaise, people's general obliviousness to the complexity and fragility of our natural world. The vision of the disembodied heads was a sinister omen. We are all doomed. I thank God, or whatever the hell that voice was, for imparting his wisdom. The trip immediately began to mellow out, and I enjoyed the usual mushroom trippiness magnified by eight ounces of cough syrup. The rainbow auras surrounding objects began to morph into bluish-purple fields of energy surrounding every object that I looked at. These were actually discoloured tracer images of whatever object I happened to be looking at at the time. The only really uncomfortable feeling that was noticeable was a great confusion that seemed to come in waves. It was as if the mushrooms and the DXM weren't synergising completely, and were fighting for control of my subjective experience. Truly weird, but somewhat enjoyable. When I got back to the campsite, C and I decided that nitrous was in order. We cracked the tiny canisters, filling each of our balloons with laughing gas. I inhaled the gas deeply, feeling control of body as well as sensations slip away from me. The last memory I have is seeing a rush of colour. I woke up some time later, C had passed out next to me, still grilling nuts. I can't remember what the hell happened, and the first part of the trip are the only lucid memories that I have. That something fucked up just happened feeling that one often feels after coming down off a trip is still lingering, and it's now Wednesday. This is probably the closest thing to religious revelation that I've ever felt, and I've learnt not to alter my consciousness like that for a while. Such are the things schizophrenia is made of. A double-edged sword. A DXM trip report by The Shadow, uploaded to Erewid.org on October 13th, 2000. Of all the drugs I've tried, the most in-depth and mentally tiring drug is DXM. Dextromethorphan, or dextromethorphan hydrobromide, usually unfound in over-the-counter medications. Yes, you can find DXM in a local supermarket under the label Robitussin Maximum Strength Cough for approximately $1 per ounce. It's perfectly legal, at least, now it is. You never know what Newt Gingrich will do next. And it's not for the weak of heart. At least not in the upper plateaus. Refer to the DXM FAQ in the Lyceum and or Erewid for more information about plateaus. I contribute this, these experiences of mine, to the vaults of Erewid in order to further educate those who are seeking knowledge of DXM. Sure, you could be a rocket scientist for all I care, you still don't know shit until you've had the experience itself. I've been to the fourth plateau and back, which speaks for itself. Really, the main questions you should ask yourself before trying DXM are, am I afraid of my own mind? Am I afraid to look deeply into it? Am I afraid of leaving my body and existence behind? You can expect all of these to happen on an upper plateau trip, but they most likely will. This contribution is meant to scare those who cannot handle DXM, and to encourage those who can to think about trying it. It's all a personal choice, because if you are pushed into it, believe me, you won't like it. The thing about DXM that first interested me was its spiritual depth at the upper plateaus. After a bit of reading the FAQ, I went to Publix and picked up an 8 ounce bottle of Robo. Throughout the week after, I experimented with two Plateau 1 trips and one Plateau 2 trips. I thought just then that I knew exactly what would happen at the high third plateau, but I was completely wrong. 
After about another week, my friend and I got together and bought two 8 ounce bottles and quickly arrived back at his house. We saluted each other, then clinked the bottles together and pointed the bottoms up as we cuzzled it down. It took about 10 minutes to slowly finish each bottle with the least amount of nausea possible. We both had taken 8 ounce of Robo. About 15 minutes later I was pacing nervously around his room, slightly off balance while he was anticipating his nausea and relaxing on his chair. I almost puked on his floor as I held it painfully down twice. As soon as it settled in my stomach again, I ran into the bathroom, only to be hit by the second plateau right at the doorway. I didn't know what was happening as I leaned into the bathroom, staring at the floor, but the puke that I saw directly below me answered my question. I had to clean it up later. I slowly but surely stepped over the puke and sat down on his bathtub next to his toilet and forced myself to puke once again. With that, I sat there for what seemed like 10 years. After about 15 minutes, or 2 years, I saw my friend run by the bathroom into the other bathroom and heard him puking into the toilet. He had his coming as well. After that he went into his room again and started playing nitrous oxide on his playstation. The next string of events seemed like only a novel could explain them, but I have trouble finding the right words to remember them by. After a short while later, the third plateau snuck up on me and grabbed me by the balls. I sat there as my body went almost completely numb, and my mind drew a complete blank. All sensory input was diminished, as I could only help but pay attention to nothing. I had the constant idea of my imminent death, but I did not fear it. It was simply a fact in my head. I could not feel fear, only sorrow. But the sorrow quickly diminished as the fourth plateau began to roll in. It most surely shouldn't have rolled in, according to my weight or dosage calculations, but it did for whatever reason. I had even checked and identified most symptoms of the fourth plateau from William White's excellent DXM FAQ. I had complete amnesia for an hour. I forgot who I was, where I was, why I was there, or why I was alive. There must have been some reason for my life. It was on the tip of my tongue, but I had no idea whatsoever. The sense of sorrow quickly diminished as if I was a broken robot waiting for its dismantlement. No emotion, just complete apathy. A sense that I had never before had. I looked into the mirror while my vision was working every now and then and wondered who that face belonged to, because it was so familiar. At times my friend would stumble by the bathroom to check on me because he knew there were razors and the like in there. Even if I wanted to use them, I couldn't summon the willpower to move my arm. Don't know how I kept my balance on the side of the tub, nor how I answered my friend when my mouth wouldn't move, but he seemed to be satisfied. What was even more interesting were the short periods of time, felt like two minutes each, where I would float over my own body, in the top corner of the roof, and watch my body stare at the wall as my friend would try to talk to me. He would give up, then come back 10 minutes later and try again in vain. Once the knowledge of who I was returned to me in a gust of cold wind, I looked up with double vision to see two of my friends standing there trying to talk to me. I had to focus on my hearing to understand what he said. He wanted me to go into the other room with him and watch some TV and look out the window. I agreed, only because he had a garbage bag with him just in case I would to vomit again, because I told him that I couldn't feel any of my body so I couldn't know if my stomach was upset or not. It took an eternity, and no time at the same time to speak. I couldn't tell. So, with my eyes plastered open as if I had drank 25 cups of coffee, as it makes you, I took giant balanced steps out of the bathroom into his room, being ever so careful to lean against things so I wouldn't fall down the stairs. Once I arrived in his room, I wondered how I got there. I was supposed to be in the bathroom. Could I have walked into his room and not remembered it two seconds later? I sat down very slowly and placed the garbage bag under my head in case. For the rest of the trip it wasn't necessary, but I didn't know that I wouldn't be vomiting anymore. The fact that I had vomited was a big factor in the mood of the trip. After I stepped down to the third plateau I found myself with a little more sanity now. I stared out the window with my wide eyes, watching a palm tree slightly sway in the breeze. I still had the double vision, so it was hard to focus on anything, but easy to focus on nothing and everything at the same time. 
After I plummeted down to the second plateau, we went to another friend's house. We described what happened to him and he was eager to try it, despite my warnings. He never told me what happened to him, but he's been doing it ever since. As I sobered up, I was left with a ray of hope for myself. The fact that I was alive. It was a sort of challenge. My halfway insane mind had lost the battle against itself, but not the war. It took about half a year for me to gather up enough courage to try it once again. This time, it was another one of my friends who had never tried it before and me. We hunted around supermarkets at around 11pm, trying to find a way to turn $11.06 into 16 ounce of robo. It involved a lot of careful planning and some shoplifting, but we did do it. We dosed at about 12.45am that night. It was a night that I will never forget. It was the night that I overcame my own mind. I had won the battle. About 1.15 my friend vomited violently and commented, I feel like shit. I had advised him to sit over his bucket and try to calm down, but it didn't work. I, however, had the mental control that night to keep myself from vomiting. There were times that I thought I was going to vomit, but I was gladly mistaken and nothing came out. I eased myself into the journey. I forget the transition from the second plateau to the third, but it clearly happened. I looked down at my watch at what seemed two minutes later and it was now 2.30am. At this point I was almost there. I had a panic attack, even though I didn't know it. My heart just started pounding violently and I started to sweat. Even though I was completely calm, I think it was my brain trying to tell me that there was something wrong, like I didn't know it. It elapsed after about 30 seconds of pounding, and then my trip took off. As I reached high third plateau, I no longer saw through my eyes. Whether they were open or closed, I didn't know. I'm still trying to sort out what happened that night. I can't remember much, only vague details. I'd found myself back in the place that I was in six months before. I was deep inside myself, taking a stroll through my own consciousness. Occasionally, something loud enough would snap me back into a semi-dazed reality. Mostly my friend tossing and turning on his bed trying desperately to go to sleep. I wanted so badly to try and comfort him, but my mouth couldn't form the words. As I was enveloped in the swirling stream of thoughts and memories intertwined, I felt as if I was a boat. I struggled to steer myself through them using the right route only to find myself back in my old situation. Will I die? Will I be a vegetable? Obviously no, because DXM didn't do that to people, at least not that kind of dosage. But my drug-induced mind was still wondering. At that moment, I used my strength and knowledge and looked to God for guidance. I felt as though I had a connection with God, one that I had never had before. Imagine the numbers 1 through 10. One being no DXM at all, and ten being a fatal overdose of DXM. All numbers greater than one bring you that much closer to death, and in that, bring you that much closer to God. The upper plateaus are most definitely meant for spirituality. I was being cradled by God as he protected me from myself. I was comforted, more than I ever had been before. If I could cry that night, I would have just then. I was continually searching through my mind, trying to reorganise it to help me understand the answers better. It was like hypnosis, and it was beautiful in a way. I saw anything and everything. I was the master and the slave of the universe, and I would give almost anything to remember what I had done to myself that night. My thoughts, my personality, my general ego had changed somewhat since that night for the better. I wish I knew exactly what I did to change myself. All I know was that it was definitely worth it. After all that had happened, I looked at my watch and noticed that it was 2.40. After another 10 years of swimming through my mind, my watch read 2.50. And after 2.50, I just stopped looking at my watch until I had lowered to the second plateau. I couldn't look at my watch anyways, because I had double vision after I had returned to reality on the third. I couldn't focus in on anything at all. As I said, I forget much of what happened. Somewhere between the second and first plateaus of coming down, my friend and I had a few short, numb conversations. It turned out that he thought he was going to die, like I did at first. He had the same terrible first trip that I had, and has told me they didn't want to do it again. I really don't know what to expect, whether or not he will try it again. The effects vary from mind to mind, 
and DXM is definitely not for everyone. You have to be strong-minded and sane, or you might end up a loony at the state mental institution. I saw it as one of the possibilities, one of the routes that my boat could take, that I could have made. Complete insanity. It had its benefits and was slightly tempting, but I had plans for my life. I still have plans for my life. I've enrolled myself in a private college, finally, to get an associate degrees in computer applications. That last DXM trip made me realise that I don't need drugs, besides the occasional beer at a special occasion, and maybe a gel tab or two once a year, to live. I can meditate and bring myself to a psychedelic high whenever I want to. I just wanted an easy high at the time. To sum it all up, I think I have finally found the peace that I deserve and have suffered for all my life. I don't know what to expect down the road, but I'm sure I can make it. If you want to take DXM, then please keep it to a recreational, lower plateau dose. Unless you know what you are doing. From what I saw on both occasions, DXM is a dangerous drug. With DXM, you can rearrange your consciousness, whether you know it or not. Or whether you know how to or not. Good luck everyone, and God bless. Beauty, Insanity and Terror A DXM and MDMA trip report by Sir Dexalot I was preparing to go to my second San Francisco rave. I planned on rolling. I had taken my last vitamin preload, 2 grams of vitamin C, 2000 IUE, 2B complex pills. I had rolled 8 times prior to this. This was my second week in San Francisco, and pills here are half the price of those in NY so I figured it would be a nice time to try too. At 9pm, I ingested 200mg of DXM. I should note that I was, am, haven't done it in a while, but I have no means decided to stop, a weekly DXM user, and this amount presented no psychological effects whatsoever to me. To be safe, 200mg was actually the first amount of DXM I ever took, and even then I felt no effect as my threshold is around 260 milligrams. The amount of DXM I took did not cause a noticeable change in temperature or mood, and I do notice feeling much better the next morning if I take a low dose of DXM before rolling. I got to the party at 10.30pm. It started at 10. There were a surprising number of people so early. I wandered around through the different rooms, settling on the trance room. At around 11 it began getting more crowded, and I purchased two pills, Blue Walking Men. I took the first one immediately. Around 45 minutes later, I began my, I'm not feeling anything, these were fake, fuck, ritual that I go through every time, knowing well that I never begin to feel the effects until around 70 to 80 minutes in. At 12 o'clock, I dropped the second pill. 15 minutes later, sure enough, I begin to feel the first pill. It begins with the nausea, then the instant feeling like a huge weight has been lifted off my body. I feel incredibly light, and motion is completely effortless. I purchase water and begin drinking. I will drink around four bottles of water throughout the night. I am a very shy person, but I get thinking, come on, you're rolling, stop being shy, as I normally do. I walk into the chill room and stand by the fan, and am greeted by a cute black girl. We introduced and I saw she had a freezer pop in her mouth. I asked where she got it and she told me the jungle room and asked me to bring her another one if I was going to get one. I did and came back. We talked a bit more and she told me a bit about San Francisco parties. Then I left to go do some more dancing. At around one o'clock, the second pill hit me fully. Oh my God, I rolled eight times before this but never have I felt this way. I realised that all this time, I had been feeling these subtle things that people talk about are so wonderful about E. 
For example, I would notice things felt different and liked how they felt different. They didn't directly feel good though. Now though, anything I touched sent a wave of joy through my body. Movement wasn't just easy and effortless, it felt utterly wonderful. I saw across the room that some other girl must have just come up on a pill. She went from slowly half dancing to beautiful movement in perfect synchrony with the music. Her face went from expressionless to ecstatic. We must have been looking at each other come up, because we exchanged a smile that held for at least 10 seconds and then returned to dancing. I returned to the other girl, who was still sitting by the fan. We call her A. I must have had a huge grin on my face, because she laughed when she saw me. I sat next to her, right by the fan. She was with this other guy, and I didn't know what their status was, so I was just talking to her, not hitting on her at all. But while talking, she put her arm around my neck and began massaging my back. Again, on my previous rolls I had felt, oh I'm rolling, this should feel good, and so it did. This time each rub produced the sensation of an orgasm throughout my entire body. Just as I was wondering what the guy she was with thought of this, he began massaging the guy standing next to him, at which point I realised I was indeed fine. Also, unlike after only a single pill where I had to somewhat push myself to not be shy, I was eager to talk to people. I was comfortable and proud of myself, and saw no reason not to share my happiness with those nearby who seemed to be interested in meeting people. A and I then got up and moved to a room with music. We exchanged positions and I massaged her. She turned around and kissed me. We kissed for several minutes and it felt wonderful. Unfortunately, she had to leave early. I wasn't sure if I said something that turned her off or she actually had to leave and I didn't want to make her feel uncomfortable. So stupid me didn't ask for her number, taking the pessimistic or careful choice. But fear not, five minutes later I saw the guy she was with, who informed me, Hey, A wanted you to call her, here is her number. This was around three o'clock. I went back to the chill room and met some new people. After a few minutes, one of them mentioned, Why is it so hard to find a pipe? No one has one. They had been looking for a pipe to smoke weed from. I had one and offered it. Obviously this established me as a member of the circle. I took four hits of this medical cannabis and decided that was enough for me. I had never smoked while on MDMA before, so I was not sure what to expect. I suspected I would continue to roll, just perhaps be slightly mellower. It seemed like it was going this way, but slowly and surely the roll went away. I was no longer social or had any desire to talk to anyone. My mind was racing. I felt at this time almost exactly as I did on LSD. I had no desire to move or speak. I sat in the corner while my mind raced. And I cannot emphasise this enough, I was no longer rolling at all. I was full blown tripping. I should also note that at this point I became separated from the group I was with. The party was scheduled to end at 6am. At around 5, I overheard the word COPS. I was terrified. COPS? Now? What will I do? I can't get home like this. I asked someone running the party and they told me not to worry, but sure enough at 5.30 the music stopped dead and the lights turned on. I was going to have to leave now. The crew asked if some people could help and clean up. I realised this is it. If I can just stay here for another hour and straighten out, I'll be fine. Then I had this image of the police coming in and busting the people cleaning up, claiming they are responsible for the party. While I realised now this thought was completely irrational, the fear of it overwhelmed me, and I decided to leave. I was alone, and I needed to get home. I knew absolutely nothing about this neighbourhood. I'd been at a party at the same venue the previous weekend, and left it around 4.30, still dark, and it seemed safe. But for some reason this time at 5.30, I walked out and it seemed terrifying. I walked across the street to the bus stop and checked my watch. 5.35. The next bus was scheduled to arrive at 5.37. Two minutes. Just two minutes and I'm safe. Please, please don't let anything happen to me. It happened. 
I saw two prostitutes. I saw nothing of this sort my previous time here, walking in one direction and another opposite. Two looked like transvestite men. After the cross, they were on opposite sides of me. They turned, looked at each other and then at me. Oh shit, get out of here. Stop standing around like a sitting duck. I soon came to realise I was also the only white person within a five block radius. I bolted out perpendicularly to them and ran through the street. A police car was coming to the intersection. I signalled him and told him, Officer, is this a safe area? I don't know how I wound up here, but I don't feel safe. I need to get to some place safe. He said, Where are you trying to go? I said, The Caltrain. He said, Okay, but I can't stop here. Meet me at the corner. So I walked on towards the corner and two more police cars followed behind. I was carrying my pipe and an eighth of weed and began to think, Oh shit, he definitely knew I was fucked up. He's going to search me and I'm going to get caught. Instantly I went from wanting nothing more than to see police everywhere to being terrified of them. A taxi pulls up behind the trio of cars. I look at the officer who is looking back at me, turn around and sprint into the cab. I tell him, Caltrain please, and he starts off. I didn't see what happened to the police cars after that. After a couple blocks he begins driving very slowly. I asked why and he said, I'm waiting for some friends. What friends, I said. Please just take me to the Caltrain. I'm waiting for my friends, he replies. After this, three people enter the car. Again, three prostitutes, two of whom appear to be transvestites. The one who sits next to me says, Don't worry, you're safe, calm down, it's okay, it's okay. I was terrified. I opened the back door and ran out and across the street. The taxi just stood there, the driver looking puzzled. I ran across the street, again realising I am the only white person in view. A man calls to me. Hey, you okay? He is black wearing a denim jacket and jeans. The clothes are dirty. He looks a bit older than the other people I saw. Probably in his forties. We'll call him C. Yeah, but I don't know where I am. Where are you trying to get to, he says. The Caltrain, I reply. Are you kidding me? You almost got yourself killed. Come with me, he says. I stare deep into his eyes. What are his intentions? Is he genuinely nice and going to help me out of this ordeal? Or is he tricking me? Trying to lure me deeper into this world so I have no hope of escape. Something convinces me of his trust. A sparkle of honesty in his eye. He begins questioning me. How did you end up here? I don't know. He's very observant. There is a faint spot of pink on my hand, facing opposite from him. The remnants of the admission stamp for the party. He sees it and says, Ah, you must have gone out clubbing last night. Where are you from anyway? I'm, I'm from New York City. This is my second week in San Francisco. As we walk past the first corner, there is a man on a bicycle. C nods to him and he nods back. Are you kidding me? Your second week and you ended up here? Don't you know this is attended territory? What? What is attended territory? He stops. Boy, are you playing me? What are you talking about? He starts walking again. Several of the people would pass. C exchanges glances and nods with. To two of them, he puts his hand behind his back to around the other side and gave some kind of hand signal. I start to think that C is some kind of gang member and I was on this gang's attended territory. I get a bit scared at this. What's going on? What are all these signals? Nothing, don't worry about it, just keep going. We walk a bit further and he asks, You high? He takes a single look at my eyes. Shit, yeah, you high as a kite. What you want, speed? I had fully dilated pupils and was probably shivering profusely, so not an unreasonable guess. No, I say. Weed? Yeah. First time, he says. Yeah, I reply. His facial expression changed quite a bit. A look of disappointment and relief in one. You fucked up, man. You know that. You fucked up. I oh, know. I never want to do this again. How old are you? 
17. He freezes at the corner. Are you playing me? No, please, I just want to get home, I say. He turns the corner, mumbling twice. 17 years old. 17 years old. We walk a couple more blocks. He asks that if he walks me several blocks more, that will give him $5 for breakfast. I agree. Again, on each block there is at least one person who C gives some kind of signal to. These times though, while walking by them he says, it's just a 17 year old kid, in addition to giving a signal. Finally he walks me to a very busy road. I recognise it as Market Street. He calls a passing taxi for me and tells the driver, make sure this boy gets to the Caltrain. I give C $7, thank him and get into the cab. There were no unexpected guests this time, thankfully. Just a simple ride to the Caltrain. After which I went home and began writing this story. The cab ride was about 10 minutes long and I got to the station at 5.59. The initial flee from the bus station occurred at 5.35. Thus, this entire ordeal must have taken a total of 15 minutes. There is no way all of this happened in 15 minutes. And this story is completely crazy. So some of this must have happened in my head. I'm pretty sure C is real, simply because I don't think I was at the point where I could come up with a person in my head and have a conversation with them like they were there. There were a lot of police in the area after the party got busted. C was very observant to things, remembered everything I said, and something didn't quite seem right about him. His attitude was not that of an old poor man living in a shitty area. I also know that the cop I told I needed to get to a safe place was real. When I told him this I was completely freaking out, shivering and probably looked terrified like someone was about to kill me. I cannot imagine this officer just ignoring me after I didn't follow him. Thus, whatever happened in those 15 minutes must have involved police somehow. This begs the question, was C actually a gang member or was he an undercover police officer? His keen observations were an acquired trait I have only seen among officers. Perhaps they thought I was in some kind of danger and could not talk to a police car, and so sent this person instead. Then who were the other people C gave these signals to? I know this sounds crazy and paranoid as fuck, but I'm pretty sure these signals were real. At the very least, the whole, he's just a 17 year old kid was definitely real. Were they members of a gang C was undercover in? Other undercover cops? What about the taxi? Were those prostitutes undercover cops who ran to my attention? And was it really in fact okay and safe? Was the whole taxi part even real? The prostitutes at the bus station? Were they going to attack me? Were they really there? I was alone and tripping in a dangerous area. I fucked up. I'm lucky to be alive or not arrested. But I'm not bothered by the... Oh my god, I could have died. It seems rather futile to hover over an issue now that it is over and I am well. Rather, I am extremely bothered by the fact that I have no idea what happened to me in those 15 minutes. I can't really find a way to express my feelings, but the idea that I don't know what happened to me, what parts of my memories were real and which were not, is terrifying to me. I had experienced weed increasing confusion on DXM trips and weed increasing trippiness of mushroom trips. But in these cases, it was just an increase in effects. With MDMA, it was completely different. It was more like weed plus MDMA equals LSD. I felt neither stoned nor rolling, but rather remarkably similar to how I did when I took the LSD. I've long been an over-the-counter junkie of sorts, and search lots of websites on information on obtaining legal highs. I've exceeded the dosage on my ADD pills, and I've also experimented with DXM before, and was somewhat disappointed. I would take 20 something gel caps and chug a bottle of cough medicine at once, and end up with unexpected results. It was like feeling drunk in a bad way, and things such as wooden doors seemed drippy with the occasional sight of colours. Well one day after a day of summer school without weed, I remember talking to my friend Ted about how Dramamine can get you high. I researched this and eventually became more interested in doing Benadryl over this, although I don't remember exactly how. 
Anyway, I was bored, so I decided to raid my medicine cabinet and found a cocktail of over-the-counters. I started by taking 15 Benadryls, 375mg, 5 Concerta ADD pills, 36mg each, then chugging a bottle of cough syrup along with 16 gel caps of DXM. Note, I had already taken 2 Concertas that morning as usual. After about 30 minutes, or less, I felt the DXM hit me, but a little differently this time. I was sitting at my desk talking to a friend on AIM about what I did. I saw some interesting visuals, but nothing major. My bed appeared to be floating, and I saw flashes of colours in my peripheral vision. This was really cool and I was pretty excited about this. However, it didn't take long for the drugs to overcome me, and about an hour or so after taking all of this, I got really tired and dozed off to sleep. When I woke up the next morning I had the most intense, realistic experience of my life concerning any drug I have ever taken. I don't think that I could describe to you how intense it was. My head felt normal and I felt completely fine. I was very disappointed that I fell asleep and I was awake earlier than normal. I started thinking really hard and trying to trip in a sort of way and it all progressively came on. I was staring at my ceiling and noticed a few flies on it. Nothing unusual, I thought. For some reason, I started thinking about how all these flies formed on the window in the movie The Exorcist, and wouldn't you know it, millions of them started forming and spreading across my ceiling. My paranoia of bugs made me think they were crawling on me, and I started writhing frantically. After a little bit, this wore off. I decided to get ready for school, so I turned on the light next to my bedstand and got startled a little. The shadows cast from the lights formed outlines of demons, demon eyes, demon bodies, demon faces with horns. I saw at least 10 or 20 demon shadows in my room. Since this always kind of interested me though, I was slightly intrigued yet a little shaken. I shook it off as a coincidence, but then things intensified. I noticed millions of little orbs and rods flying across my room from the hallway back and forth. Literally millions. But I really could only see them as flashes of light at first and then kind of vibrated my eyes back and forth to clearly see them. Still I was intrigued, being the supernatural enthusiast that I am. Not that I wasn't scared, I was still reasonably calm considering what was happening but my heart was pounding pretty hard. What happened next was what really scared the shit out of me. I walked out into the kitchen to get a drink and in the window was an alien. Kind of what you'd see in pictures except this one stared at me with evil eyes. He kept shape-shifting too. Sometimes he'd have horns, other times he wouldn't. His bone structure would shift and he was eventually accompanied by a midget hooded alien looking just as evil. You'd think this would be funny, but to see it plain as day staring at you is pretty scary. After this I freaked out completely. I woke my parents up and told them what I saw, and I looked right at them but they didn't see anything. I was spazzing out, somewhat, yelling, how the hell can you not see them? After that I walked back in my room and walked up to one of my windows. In the reflection I saw a decapitated baby arm laying next to my feet and a demon eating it. I remember kicking on the ground and actually feeling the arm too. I told my parents that I only took some cold medicine the previous night, which they believed. My parents had me stay home from school that day and called my grandma to come over and watch me for the day as well. They said my pupils were huge. I saw aliens everywhere. In every reflection, every shadow, every pattern, there was some form of an alien. I even watched The Simpsons and there were animated aliens in the cartoon. I asked my dad for the digital camera too and I took pictures of what I saw. When I looked through the lens facing my backyard, there were hundreds of them walking around casually. Some were calm and nice while others were scary, evil looking. When I'd take a picture of them it'd show up different than when I first saw them. They'd change shape in the picture and then again when I looked at the picture again. Sometimes they smiled or posed in funny ways which eased my tensions a little bit. My grandma definitely helped out a lot. She told me to just relax and calm down and prayed for me too. She's very religious. It was kind of weird when I did this, because when I relaxed, 
The evil look on their faces instantly transformed into a smile, and the alien would disappear and a new one would spawn. It was kind of like in one of those movies where people fall in love and it plays that stupid classic love song. Well, the rest of the day wasn't much different. I laid down and saw reflections of aliens on my shoulders and occasionally I'd feel slimy hands touching me, but as long as I relaxed I kept it under control and was eventually able to sleep. I went to the doctor's office and my counsellor that day as well, and was told I'd be fine and just needed to relax, sleep, rest and that sort of thing. I also saw this weird shadow of a gnome holding a knife as well. That day was pretty scary, but I also saw some funny things too. The first evil alien I saw in my kitchen window at one point was holding and smoking a crack pipe. I also saw an alien having sex with a chipmunk next to the shed in my backyard. I was still shaken though, and every reflection and shadow held an image of an alien. I know this is a highly unusual experience, but it actually happened. I went to bed, and the next morning the hallucinations were gone. What a relief. Story 2 Okay, well, being the smart person that I am, I decided to try Benadryl again. I bought some at my local pharmacy and was ecstatic. I decided to take it alone this time, with the exception of my daily dose of two 36mg concertas. I did it before a youth group at my church, figuring this would provide a good trip this time. I arrived an hour early to church and already took the Benadryls, 500mg all at once, and decided to take a walk back into the backwoods behind the church as I usually do. There is a trail that leads to a field about 200 yards back. I lit up a cigar and smoked about half of it while I was back there and cranked my MP3 player to techno music and a little grunge. I was feeling a nice cigar buzz as normal and it was getting dark so I started walking back. I stopped where I could see the church and was at the opening of the field. I called up my friend about something completely erroneous and started tripping while on my cell phone. I saw some aliens again, but this time I just laughed because I was used to it and didn't care much. I saw the outline of the Grim Reaper in the trees and didn't care much either. Hell, I was having a blast. I still had a cigar in my hand and some other kids were walking towards me, so I stuffed it in my pocket, but it burned out, and casually paced. The girl among the two commented on my shirt, which was cool and made me happy because she was pretty hot. I started walking back and thought I saw my friend walking with a cop, but it turned out to be his girlfriend, which was very weird. I sat down in the church when I got back and saw fun stuff. The floor was moving and people's reflections in one of the windows by me were acting completely different from what the actual people were doing, and it was really funny. Sometimes there were reflections of people and things that weren't actually there. I really enjoyed it this time though, go figure. The only problem I had that night was that the pastor's son kept shoving green play-doh in my hair and telling me I smelled like smoke, which I did badly, but it didn't faze me too much. I went to bed and took 600mg the next morning before school. I saw similar stuff, mostly moving floors and shifting patterns, no aliens though. Both of these times were fun but it ended by 9th period. I was tired and took a nap when I got home. The second and third time were wicked fun, probably because I got used to it and I didn't mix it with DXM or something like that. I should also state that I've smoked lots of marijuana in my past. Smoked cigars, cigarettes, sniff pain pills, little coke, tiny bit of shrooms, very bad cow dung shrooms. Done DXM a few times, had incredibly high amounts of caffeine in the form of coffee and pills together, taken 12 plus ADD pills at once, with caffeine too, and have drank a lot of alcohol. My tolerance to drugs is pretty high from all of this, and possibly genealogy, not to mention that I'm a considerably heavy guy. One last time I mixed DPH with DXM, in what was later to be noticed as a stupidly high dose. I was with my friends and all at once I went from dead sober to completely ripped out of reality. My friends turned into Simpsons characters with devil horns. They were yellow and animated looking. Words were surreal and conversations took a lot of effort. Just relaying to them that I was strongly tripping seemed like I was trying to contact the past. I left the table where we were playing some sort of card game and drinking beer 
and I entered another room where I saw ants and a green slime all over the wall. The ants were collecting the slime in several spots on the walls and moved at random, no patterns. I said to my friend that I was worried his parents would come home and know we were high if we didn't clean up the ants or slime. For the rest of the trip I would periodically forget I was high, and once again tell my friend we should clean the walls or we would get caught. I must have said this six times or so. We'll have to go to a corner store for snacks or something. I don't know why we did that. I was terrified. I was absolutely not in reality. Everything looked alien and the landscape was completely different. I literally thought we had gone to another planet. It looked nothing like Earth. Standing outside the store because I couldn't go in, I saw vast highways of spaceships in the sky. This is when I realised and was 100% convinced we weren't on Earth, but for some reason this really didn't bother me. It seemed so natural and proper. We arrived back at my buddies and they put on Guitar Hero. I tried to scrape the slime off the wall but it was very sticky and I was afraid of getting ants on my arms, so I gave up. I played Guitar Hero which sounded like words, not guitar notes. That proved to be too trippy and I gave up. I started feeling damn delirious, and it seemed all my friends couldn't hear me anymore. I knew they could, but when they would respond to me I wouldn't understand it, and it happened so quick I couldn't remember if they did answer me. From this point until we slept, I laid in one spot on the floor curled up, because my three friends were on the couch, and what I saw still scares me to this day, seven years later. All of their eyes, ears, noses and mouth were pouring blood. It ran down their faces and down the torsos and onto the floor where it streamed to different places in puddles. I could smell it and it was very unpleasant. Then to make it worse, spiders started crawling out of their mouths. They came out at an alarming rate and violently. I watched as my friends bled from every orifice and vomited spiders. The spiders all came and surrounded me but there was an invisible glass chamber I perceived myself sitting in because the spiders would come within 6 inches of me all 360 degrees around, but couldn't get on me. This was relieving because I am terrified of spiders. I remember sitting there completely terrified for hours watching this happen to my friends, and then I fell asleep under a coffee table because it was the only spot that wasn't covered in blood or infested with spiders, which were building webs all around the house. Upon asking my friends what I looked like while I watched spiders and blood pour from their faces for what seemed like hours, they told me that I mentioned spiders and blood and looked freaked right out and it did last roughly two hours, but they said I was not sitting on the floor, I was actually pacing around the room muttering about ants and slime and spider webs, all of which I still was convinced needed to be cleaned up or else would get caught by his parents in the morning. I made remarks about the spiders building webs and how it was hurt to have spiders crawling out of your mouth, but I never said these things to my friends, I just muttered them. They thought I was going crazy, because apparently nobody tripped as hard as I, and they still had a decent grip on reality. Ever since I first read DM Turner's excellent essential psychedelic guide and saw his glowing reports on the combination of ketamine and bees, 2CB, I have had quite a hankering to try an entheogenic cocktail of that variety. Bees have been plentiful lately, but ketamine is as hard as ever to come by for me. Recently I had an interesting idea. Since DXM is relatively close chemically and experientially to K, as well as being cheap, legal and easy to acquire, why not use it as a substitute in the combo? So the other night I took 300mg of DXM in the form of Drix Oral Cough Liquid Caps, a preparation that contains no other unwanted active ingredients like acetaminophen, guaifenesin or pseudephedrine, and has the added advantage of being low on sugars and syrups that can cause gastric distress in large doses. This dose of DXM alone would not be sufficient to evoke a fully dissociative episode for me, but I decided to err on the side of caution, as I usually do when trying a new mix. After an hour or so, I began to feel the euphoria that is my first alert with this particular material, and took them 20 milligrams of bees. I was chatting on IRC at the time, and within 20 minutes typing became much too complicated to deal with, so I laid down and relaxed into the trip. There were some uncomfortable somatic symptoms at first, 
such as a feeling of physical heaviness similar to that induced by alcohol, minor stomach upset and hot flashes, which had me a little worried until I took my temperature and found it to be normal. Fortunately, these passed quickly as my consciousness dissociated from my body. I began to feel as if my soul was a soaring kite that was connected to my physical form by only the thinnest ethereal guide rope. Then my physical awareness seemingly vanished, and I found myself in a state that was nearly identical to the experience of ketamine that I'd had on the two occasions I was lucky enough to acquire some. I felt that I reverted back to the ground of being, the original undifferentiated oneness, the primal monad. Everything was perfect, all was one, and it was me. Then something fantastic happened. I felt as though I was given an opportunity to experience the original creation process that produced the material universe. I saw, felt, and perceived the monad make love to itself and give birth to what we know as the manifest cosmos. I was the monad making love and giving birth, and it felt incredible, like multiple orgasms of universal proportions. This was a very meaningful episode for me, because it seemed to afford a pointed insight into one of the main philosophical questions I'd been thinking about for quite some time. The question was, why did the monad split in the first place? Why disturb that original pristine oneness at all? As I shivered and shook with the pleasure of the birthing process, the answer seemed very clear. Simply for the joy of the doing, not because of any kind of expected result. The universe is a work in progress, not a finished product, and it is the process of creation that is most important. That episode lasted maybe half an hour or so, and then I began to gradually regain my physical consciousness. I spent the rest of the trip in a lovely state that I can only describe in terms of post-coital glow on a cosmic scale, accompanied by the lovely visuals that are characteristic of the bees. Near the end of the experience, I had the opportunity to smoke some salvia, and had the feeling of communing with the spirit of the plant. It felt great, very warm and comforting. Scar Maria definitely likes the bees, she seems to like me too. I slept about four hours and awoke the next morning feeling reborn and refreshed, enjoying a quite delightful afterglow that lasted the entire day. I recommend the combination of bees and dissociatives highly. I will most definitely be doing further exploration along these lines in the future when the opportunity presents itself.